Just while we're standing, stay standing for a moment and just want to acknowledge everyone that's joining us online as well. You know, I heard that, I've had probably listened to that song probably about 20 times because uh, I got to hear it because um, they said you should listen to this before you speak. And every time it gets me, um, this whole Sunday nights of in uh, this month, I just had to stop there because I forgot what months we're in. It's gone so fast in August. It's been um, all about the time I met Jesus. And to be honest, for me, it's 31 years ago. But in a lot of ways, it feels like last week. I've never moved too far away from that time I met Jesus. And I guess one of the reasons for that is because I keep telling people about the time I met Jesus. And usually it's on the other side of a table or it's in a park or in the surf or, or on a plane and, and, and people are trying to get away, but tonight no one's trying to get away, which is fantastic. But I wanna pray because I met Jesus. I met Jesus. He radically, radically changed my life. And my prayer tonight is not that we talk about Him, and that's important. My prayer tonight is that we encounter Him. All of us, no matter who we are, no matter how long we've been here, maybe some of you it's the first time and you have to know God has appointed you for this moment to hear this message because He loves you. And for the rest of us, especially when life gets complicated, we've got to come back to Him. So Father, I do pray and it's hard. It's hard, Father, because when you've encountered your love in such a real way, you can't give it. People have to receive it from you. We can talk about it, we can describe it, but unless you come, unless you intervene, unless Holy Spirit, you arrest our hearts and you pour out your love, we never really will understand. But I thank you that tonight, that's exactly what you're doing. You're arresting every heart. You're pouring out your love. You're bringing us back to Him, to Jesus. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power. But mostly I thank you that tonight we will experience the love of God in a fresh and in a, in a real way that uncomplicates things, that brings wholeness and healing into things. And especially those who are yet to know you, that tonight they will come to know you because Holy Spirit, you're arresting their heart. Those that are backslidden tonight, they're gonna come to their senses and they're gonna come running home to you. And for the rest of us, we will return to our first love. And I just thank you for that in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. amen. Why don't you take a seat? Um, the time I met Jesus. <laughs> you know, um, if I had social media back in 1991, we didn't even have um, uh, MySpace back then, you know. <laughs> but if we had, if we had, if we had access, if I had access to it in 1991, I have to tell you, my post and my feed would look like I was living the dream. I was living my best life. Have you seen that? You just see people's social media photos and they're just living their best life. They're travelling and they're doing everything that you want to do, but you can't because you've got a real life. And for me, in a lot of ways, that was my life. I mean, at 22, I'm working in a surf shop. I'm surfing twice a day, every day. I got my first trip to Bali was a surf trip in 1989. There was no hotel on the cliffs of Uluwatu. There was a jungle you had to go through to surf Uluwatu back then. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, it was. It was like I was living my best life. There was lots of parties. That's what we did. And I gave myself to anything and everything that I wanted. Everything and anything. And you could see the feed already, you know, parties and, and uh, all sorts of things that went with that. The girls, the drugs, the drinking, 
the fun, and it was fun for a little while. And on the outside, it all looked great. But the problem is on the inside, it was a very different story. And I think that's the thing when you look at feeds and see, see people's social media, see them living their best life on the outside. It may look like their best life, but on the inside, it's a very different story. See, living so self-absorbed and doing everything and anything I wanted whenever I wanted, what I didn't realise was actually leading me down a road of just darkness, emptiness, brokenness. Every new sexual encounter left me just a little bit more empty. Every new party left me just a little bit more broken. And I gave myself to all the things that some of you think is going to be fantastic and awesome. And it starts off that way, but it doesn't end that way. You know, in a lot of ways, my life got to the point where it felt like a jigsaw puzzle, but it had one whopping big missing piece in it. And I thought if I could just find that piece, My life would be complete. I'd find what I'm looking for. You know, I had a great time in Bali in 1989, but I came back and guess what? As good as it was, everything, all the great feelings and all the excitement and all the stuff that went with it just went away. Every party after the next day, it just went away. Every surf I had, had, you you know, that feeling, it just went away. And I got to the point where I started thinking, there's gotta be more to life than this. There has to be more to life than this. Because I know the darkness. I've had the depression. I wondered whether it was still worth living. I went through all of that. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was, I think I must have been just, it was just before my 22nd birthday, but I call it my birthday encounter with born again Christians, period. It was like a chapter in my life. I could not get away from them. And I remember I'd lost my license for speeding because I had a yellow VW Beetle. There's a red combi, but mine was a yellow VW Beetle. Like I said, I was living my best life. And... uh, and uh, my mate got a brand new car and, you know, his car obviously was a lot faster than mine. You remember the Ford Capri convertible? I mean, it was a pretty cool thing in 1989, 1990. And, uh, and so I've gone, we've gone for a drive down to Torquay because I grew up in Geelong and I, I, I worked in, at the Billabong surf shop in Torquay for a while and made wetsuits for a while, but that's where I surfed, that's where I did everything I did. And if you've heard of Bell's Beach, that was my local break. And uh, anyway, I lost my license that night where he got, I got to drive his car. And back in the day, you would hitchhike because there was no serial murderers back then that would try, would kill you usually. Although we have found out since that there was plenty, we just didn't know at the time. <laughs> and so I would hitchhike everywhere. And I remember I'd hitchhike because I'd have to go surfing, you know. And I'd hitchhike, and for this chapter of my life, you know, every second car that picked me up, they were born again Christians. I couldn't get away from them. One time, a whole minibus full picked me up. There must have been some youth ministry going somewhere. And I, they pulled up, I got in, and I said, I'm going to Torquay. They said, yeah, we're going to Torquay. So I jump in, and I've got to tell you, it was the longest half an hour ride of my life. Because all of them, I think if they must have been on some, you know, got their little badge for witnessing, because they all had to go and tell me about Jesus. And the thing was, it wasn't that I disagreed with them. I believed that there must have been a God. I sort of believed in, you know, that in Jesus, but it was totally irrelevant to me. I wanted nothing to do with it because all I knew was religion and I didn't want that. I didn't want that. But they, you know, so they're talking to me about Jesus and, and um, the thing was, I knew about him. They talked like they knew him. And they had something 
And was that something on you that I was missing? I'll never forget one time, it was the last guy that picked me up and I'm hitchhiking back, trying to get back to Geelong and see my family and I'm stoned. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hitchhiking and this car goes past and stops about 100 metres down the road. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, he's going to drive off when I get there, you know, which sometimes they did in, back then and <laughs> had uh, waved and had fun, you know. So I get there, I get there, I finally get there and he doesn't go. So I opened the car and said, you're going to Geelong? He said, yes. So I, I get in the car, I'm sitting there and I'm paranoid because I'm stoned. And I'm thinking, I've got to say something to this guy. He's taken me, you know, and uh, to Geelong. And so there's a book on the ground and I don't know, I thought maybe it was a book on pigeons or something because it had a bird on the cover. And I just picked it up and went, that looks interesting and put it down again and looked straight out the window, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this guy starts talking to me about Jesus. But there was something different this time. It felt like God Himself was in the car. And He's telling me that Jesus loves me, that, that God loves me, but I've sinned. I need to give my life to Jesus. And when I realised He was a Christian, I asked if He could actually take me a little bit further because I knew Christians probably couldn't say no. So I got Him to drop me off around the corner of my house. I didn't want to show Him where I live because He was a Christian. And uh, I'll never forget, we get there, the car stops and he says, will you give your life to Jesus? And I said, no, that's all right. I'll do it when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> and he drives off. But this is the crazy thing. I didn't see a car drive off in that moment. I felt like God had just given me an invitation and I'd said no. Around the same time, it's amazing when God's working in your life, I'd, I'd started getting convicted doing the things that used to be fun. So I'd be stoned and I'd be with my friends and, and all of this thought would come, what if Jesus came back now and caught you like this? I'd never had that thought before ever in my life. <laughs> and now I'm like watching the clock and hoping, you know, like stop being stoned, stop being stoned, because what if Jesus came back and caught me like this? And I started getting paranoid that Jesus was gonna come back and catch me doing the wrong thing. The crazy thing is it worked because it actually started weaning me off the drugs because I was so paranoid every time I was stoned. God was doing something in my life. I found this little Gideon Bible. Gideon are great. They make these little Bibles. So when you don't want anyone to know you're reading the Bible, you can hide it in your pocket. And that's what I did. I'd go to the Billabong surf shop and it was winter time and no one ever came into a surf shop at winter time. And I'd have the whole day and I'd pull out my little Gideon's Bible, I'd read it and someone walk in, I'd put it under the counter because I didn't want anyone to know I'm reading the Bible. But God had started doing something in my life. And then one day I said, Jesus, if you're real, how do I get to know you? Not know about you, know you. I didn't want to go to church just to go to church. I wanted to know him. And he reminded me, I had this thought of my friend's mum. I knew she was a Christian. I knew he wasn't because he was my friend. And I rang her and I said, can I come to church? And she says, actually, she didn't say anything for a little bit, right? And I think she fell over, to tell you the truth. And then she says, after, almost after about a minute, she says, yes, yes, of course. She goes, it was a Sunday. She goes, church is on tonight. I said, great, I'll come. Now, all I know is I don't know Jesus. People are talking to me like they know Him. I'm missing something in my life. God's at work in my life. And maybe I've tried everything else. And He was the only one left. I tried other spiritual things. That didn't turn out good. And so here I am, I go to church and it's a funny thing when you walk into church for the first time. And for those of you, maybe it's your first time, hey, we get it. But as I walk in, she meets me and everyone's really nice to me. And I'm thinking, what do they want? You know, one hand on my wallet. <laughs> 
you know, and they're all nice and I sit there and, and the worship's on and they're like this and I'm looking around going, I've never seen this before. But again, Jesus, if you're real, how do I get to know you? Then the preacher gets up and he starts preaching. And it was like every single thing he said, it was like he was talking to me. And I started thinking, she rang him to tell him I was coming. <laughs> Anyone know what I'm talking about? She rang him to tell him I was coming and gave him the list of all the things about my life because it was like no one else was there. And at the end of the night, this is incredible. At the end of the night, my question was, Jesus, if you're real, how do I get to know you, know you? I know about you, I know about you. I grew up knowing about you. I saw you on a cross. How do I know you? And so the preacher says, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, who wants to know Jesus, come out the front. Do you know, it's the only time in all of my time at that church for about a year that I ever heard those words. In, there's lots of altar calls, but not that way. And when he said that, it was like, that's me. That's why I'm here. And I literally felt like God had lassoed me and was pulling me to the front. And in my head, it's like, there's no way in the world. There's 600 people here. I work in Billabong. I'm not walking down the front. I don't know any of these people. And yet all of a sudden, it's like, you need to go. You need to go. And it's like, hang on a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If you go down the front, mate, there's no more drugs, no more partying and no more girls. And I thought, I can, I can give up the drugs, I can give up the partying. I just wasn't sure about the girls. <laughs> just being honest. And then this thought comes out of nowhere. You've been doing all these things anyway. And where have they got you? And I said to her, I looked at my friend's mum and I said, do you mind if I go down the front? And she said, absolutely. And next thing you know, I th I'm pretty sure she's kicked me down the aisle because that was some pretty big early steps. And as I'm walking down, this is a crazy thing. It was like no one else was there. All of a sudden, I was so aware that I had sinned. I had hurt God with my life and I was so sorry. But I had no idea what I was about to encounter. And as I'm walking down the front, I'm literally bawling my eyes out. And then I pray the sinner's prayer. And in that moment, I have encounter with Jesus. All of a sudden, that emptiness, it's gone. That brokenness, it's healed. The presence of God, it's in my life. I had no idea. I knew, I knew something radical had happened because when I'd got home, the first thing I did was vacuum my room. But wait, <laughs> but wait, but wait, that's not all. I moved the bed back and vacuumed behind the bed as well. And my family was standing at the door. I can still see them all standing at the door looking at me. They knew I went to church. I'm vacuuming in my room. They had no idea what had happened. They knew there was a miracle. It was a miracle. And from that moment, literally from the next day, I, every opportunity I had, I started telling people about Jesus. I had no idea what I was talking about, but I met him. I wanted them to know him. I even looked up a lot of my ex-girlfriends and went and visited them <laughs> with great shock. Some I had to start with sorry. <laughs> but I'll never forget one of them said to me, I'm a good person. Why would God not accept me? And you know what my deep theological answer to them was? I don't know. You just need to give your life to Jesus. And the other thing I started doing was I just started reading my Bible. Literally hours and hours and hours of Bible reading every single day. And that's when I realised that so much of what I believed about God, so much of what I believed about Christianity just wasn't true. Because as I began to re read the Bible and learn the truth about God and Christianity, who I was, I realised I had no idea. See, I had no idea that you had to be born again. You know, Jesus in John 3, 3 says, most assuredly I say to you, unless someone is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, I thought that was a title you gave some weirdo Christians. And I met a few, now I'm one. 
but I had no idea you had to be born again. You see, you've got to understand God made you. He made me. I'm not an accident. I'm not a monkey that got lucky. It's not some random chance. I have been designed and predestined by God. I began to learn that that God made me. Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in His own image and likeness. He created them, male and female. But then I understood something as I continued to learn. The problem was, even though God made me, I'd sinned. We've sinned and sin separates us from God. It separates us from God. So God makes us, we sin, it separates us. Listen to this, all of us are in the same boat for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God who made us to live with Him, now because of sin, we're separated from God and it gets worse. The wages of sin is death. I had no idea. We don't just die physically. The Bible says we're born dead spiritually. We're born dead spiritually. That's why everyone, all of humanity is searching for something and trying to find that missing piece. Because the God who's meant to live in us is now separated from us. And we now, not only a judge because of sin, the wages of that sin is death, but it gets worse again. Judgment. I had no idea. I had no idea. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And it is appointed for man to die Once, you don't get a second chance. Once you die, that's it. But after that, the judgment. I had no idea. I had no idea uh, that, that we've all sinned and we're separated from God and the wages of sin is death. You and I are dead spiritually to God. Then, if that's not bad enough, living dead spiritually to God on earth, when we stand before Him, we will all stand before a judge and be judged for that sin. Revelation says, it says that anyone whose name's not in that book of life, they're gonna get thrown into the lake of fire. I had no idea. I had no idea. No wonder these people were so passionate about trying to tell me about Jesus. No wonder there was an urgency in their voice to try and get me back over to the other side. But this is a crazy thing. I don't think it, I don't think we, we, I don't think it's, it's, it goes um, without notice because you think about it. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good works a lot of good morals, a lot of religion, because I think deep down inside, we all know that we are away from God. We all know that we're gonna stand before God one day and we're doing our best to try and even out the score. But this is the thing, good works, good morals and religion cannot, cannot bridge the gap back to God. It can't do it. Doesn't matter how good you are, You could give up everything now and serve the poor, it's not enough. You could become the most religious person, it's not enough. You could live the most moral life, it's not gonna be enough. Guys, that's called bad news. Let me tell you why the gospel's called good news. It's because God, God, He sends Jesus, listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we're still sinners, guess what? Christ died for us. Jesus died for us. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, 
being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So God who loves us, who knows that we'll never be able to bridge the gap ourselves back to Him, He does it for us by sending Jesus to die in our place, to take our sin and our judgment upon Him. So God does that. But can I say in a lot of ways, I also knew that. I was a good Catholic boy. I knew that, but what I didn't know was I actually had to do something about that. You see, in John chapter 3, 16, it said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For whoever calls on the Name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the thing, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know I had to actually do something. I had to make a conscious decision, now that I knew, to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. And in Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you and I want to say to you, I didn't know you had to be born again. But guess what? You now know. You now know. God loves you. God's for you. Everything in God is for good towards you and He has made a way so we no longer need to live separated from Him and because there is no condemnation, none, for those that are in Christ Jesus, amen? Let's go back to that guy who picked me up. Mate, I knew I had 29 um, part series here. I've got so many notes, but let's finish with this. So this guy that picks me up, the one with the pigeons, you know, I've got the one who told me about Jesus, felt like God drove off. Okay, three months after I get saved, I meet him on the beach. Okay, I'm getting out of the surf at 13th Beach, I'm walking back to the car and he's fishing. And I recognise him and I run over, I literally run over to him, he's like, he's <laughs> <laughs> he can't believe what's going on. Who's this guy running? I said, hey, hey, remember me? And he's like looking. I said, three months ago, I was hitchhiking. You picked me up. You dropped me off at my house. You told me about Jesus. You need to know, I met Jesus. And he was like horrified and shocked. He couldn't believe it worked. <laughs> but listen to this. He says, he said, let me tell you a funny story. I saw you hitchhiking and the Holy Spirit said, stop and pick him up. And I said, no, and I drove past you. And then God said, stop and pick him up. So I stopped, that's why I was 100 metres down the road. Then you get in the car and I'm saying, God, give me a sign to talk to him about Jesus. And then you pick up the book on the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. He goes, and so when you picked up in the book and said, that's interesting, I thought, that's my sign. (laughs) Listen to Romans chapter 10. And for those of you following me, I'm on my last page. Romans chapter 10. For whoever calls on the Name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the Gospel of peace. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I understand there's a stigma around our Christianity. I understand. It's not easy to say you're a Christian. At the moment, it's not easy to say you're a Christian that goes to Hillsong. (laughs) But I love it anyway. (laughs) What? 
It's not easy. I understand that. I understand people are going to be quick to label and judge you and to try to ostracise you when you go to stand up for your faith, when you go to share your faith. The world may see it as a stigma. The world may see it as something that's repulsive, but I've got to tell you something. When we take the time and take the risk and step out, and like that guy who took the time to step out and pick me up, when we do that to others and we share our faith and we tell them about Jesus and we say there's a God that loves them, I have to tell you, it's not a stigma in heaven. It's how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. You have to know every time you talk about Jesus, every time you share your testimony and do not be afraid of your testimony. It's powerful. That's how we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You don't, they had no idea when I didn't show any interest. They had no idea when I didn't want it, want, didn't want to listen to them that God was actually doing something in my life. And let me finish with this scripture and then we'll pray. You know, I'm so grateful that people took a risk and told me about Jesus. I don't know where my life would be. I'm so grateful. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. They're they're social media, they live in the best life. But Jesus knows that deep down inside they're weary, they're scattered like sheep with no shepherd. And this is what he says. And I'm gonna ask the band to come up. He says, look, look. He says, the harvest is truly plentiful. Okay? But the labourers are few. God, we have never lived in a skies. We have never lived in a season where the harvest is more ready. I don't know how you see COVID. But let me tell you what COVID's done. It has totally shifted what people have put their trust in. It's left people asking questions and wondering what's this all about? It's absolutely left them wanting. And the only answer is Jesus. There's never been a time in our history where people are more open and more ready to receive, not religion, but to hear the good news of Jesus. And Jesus says, therefore, because the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into His harvest field. How do you see the people in your world that don't know Jesus? I'll tell you how Jesus sees them. He doesn't see them having it all together. He doesn't see them shut off. He sees them weary, scattered in need of Him. He sees them as a harvest ready to be reaped. And He's looking to us. He's looking to you and me to be labourers in His harvest field. And this is the great thing. This is not the harvest field. People are gonna make decisions tonight for Jesus here online. You're gonna make decisions tonight. But the harvest field, it's in your school. It's in your university. It's in the street that you live in. It's in the shopping centre that you go shopping. It's in your workplace. It's, the, it's in your, where you do your sport. Wherever you find yourself, God has placed you there. You may have a job as a teacher, but your purpose is the harvest. I wonder if we could all stand to our feet. You know, I'm so grateful. I'm so, we can remove that if you like. I'm so grateful that people actually took the chance, the risk, got the courage, overcame their fear, the awkwardness to take the time to actually tell me about Jesus. 
And I honestly believe this. I believe that Jesus now is saying to us, how will they know unless you tell them, unless you bring them? And I really do pray that we don't do it out of duty. We don't do it because we have to. We don't do it because we're trying to get brownie points with God. We do it because it just happens naturally over the overflow of our love for Him. See, I was in love with Jesus. I, I can't help but talk about Jesus. When Kai started dating Kylie, everyone knew I was dating Kylie. They couldn't believe that I had scored Kylie. I couldn't believe I scored Kylie. And I'm telling everyone. And that's what it's like with Jesus. You fall in love with Him, you tell people about Him. And they see you're in love with Him and they think, we don't have that. That's what we need. I wonder if we could, just for a moment, we're gonna do two things tonight. The first thing is this, are you born again? Okay. I don't think you can get it much clearer than that. And the only way you can know you're born again is if you have made a conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, recognising that you have sinned, asking Him to forgive you of your sin and then to come into your life. And the Bible says that when you do that, He comes, He forgives. And in that moment, what was dead comes alive. You don't get a bunch of rules to follow when you're a Christian. God makes your spirit alive and now His rules are written in your heart. It just becomes the natural thing you wanna do. So if that's you, I wonder if we could all close our eyes, bow our heads online. I'm talking to you as well. If you've never ever made that conscious decision to give your life to Jesus, then tonight's your night. Like me, I came to church thinking, Jesus, if you're real, how do I get to know you? I'm not sure the question that you asked, but I know the God that's speaking to you right now. And He's the one that's drawing you to Him. I had to have that moment in my life where I realised, hey, hang on a minute. All these things that are saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I've been doing it and it's got me nowhere. And that wrestle is normal because your old nature, your sin nature, the, the nature you were born with doesn't want you to have anything to do with God and it will fight you. But it comes a time when you have gotta say, no, I'm surrendering. And some of you have been fighting God for a long time and tonight is the night you surrender. You surrender. Others of you who've walked with God and you've walked away from God. Maybe it's COVID got the best of you, stuff's happened. Maybe you've sinned and you've compromised and the devil's just keep, keeps reminding you why you shouldn't come back to God. I've got great news for you. The moment you turn to look to Him, He will come running to you. He'll wrap His arms around you. He will forgive you and bring you back into the family and treat you as if you've never, ever walked away. So if that's you, why do you raise your hand and say, Sam, that's me. I need to get born again. Raise your hand nice and high. Raise your hand nice and high, fantastic. Saying yes to Jesus, yes to Jesus, fantastic. People raising their hands, brilliant. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know I'm talking to you. Raise your hand nice and high. Say, Sam, that's me. Yeah, good on you, fantastic, fantastic. Keep your hand up, don't be ashamed of Jesus. He's not ashamed of you. Say, yes, Sam, that's me. I am giving my life to Jesus. Come on, raise your hand quickly. I'm gonna pray, we're gonna pray a prayer together. Say, Sam, that's me. I need to get born again. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Fantastic, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Brilliant. Let's all pray this prayer together, guys. Dear Jesus, I thank You that You died on the cross for my sin and You rose again. I believe You are Lord and I ask that You forgive me of my sin and that You'll come into my life and that You'll be my Lord and Saviour. I thank You. I'm now a child of God. I've been born again. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen. Can we give everyone a hand? Can we really celebrate when someone goes from death to life?
I think we need to be reminded that this is a powerful moment. God loves you. This is what we want to do, please, please. I had no idea. I had no idea until I started reading this and discovering the truth. And people helped me with that. And we wanna help you with that. So there are people who are those outside the doors and on, online, why don't you put, put in the chat, I prayed that prayer. And we're gonna help you as well. But do us a favour, the best way is not just grab one of these Bibles, but give us your details, because we wanna help you take that next step, amen? Usually this is the end of the service and we all get let off the hook, but not tonight. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Labourers are few. And guys, can I just be the first to say, when it comes to my labouring, right now, I don't have any calluses. It's been months since I've told anyone about Jesus. I need to get back into the harvest field. I have to make a conscious decision to get back in the harvest field and to start talking about Jesus to the same way people talk to me about Jesus, inviting them and bringing them to church. I just wonder if you looked at your hands, when was the last time? When was the last time you picked up the sickle and went into the harvest and just shared your story? And this is the great thing. We get to hit reset because tomorrow is a brand new day. But I wonder who would be bold enough to say, Holy Spirit, I'm in, but I need your help. If that's you, why don't you raise your hands? We're gonna pray and then we're gonna worship and then we're done. You let Him know, you let Him know. Say, I'm in. Already I believe the Holy Spirit is putting people on your heart to speak to. Already I believe the Holy Spirit is already giving you strategy. Already the Holy Spirit is at work, not just in your heart, but in the hearts of the people He's sending you to. And, in, and you need to know He's preparing the way for you. So Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to the harvest. We thank You for Jesus. We thank You that as a church, Lord, I thank You for everything You do for us. But Lord, may it be felt in our schools. May it be felt in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever our feet go. May they be beautiful feet, bringing good news in Jesus' Name. Amen, Amen. Come on, let's worship Him.